world and welcome to New World Witchery. I'm Lane. And I'm Corey. This is the first in a series of special episodes which will be featuring specific topics in magic uh, which we feel transcend uh, a single tradition. Mm -hmm. So in this episode we're going to be discussing witch bottles. Yay, witch bottles! And we're pretty excited about it, so... We hope that you are too. Uh, Stay tuned and we'll be back after this very short break. bottles. So first of all, let's discuss what a witch bottle is. Yes. Um, now it seems to vary a little bit from tradition to tradition, but in general, a witch bottle is a jar, jug, small, uh, usually earthenware, glass, ceramic, mm-hmm. some kind of a breakable, hard substance uh, used to contain uh, a little little bits and baubles uh, that are used in spells. Mm-hmm. And they're um, mostly for protection, right? Yes, usually for protection um, against harmful magic or against harmful uh, witchcraft. Right, but they could also be used as a form of hex? Yes, I've seen references to them being used where somebody would create the witch bottle using their target's uh, personal concerns. That's uh, when you get into a witch bottle, you have usually um, something sharp and pointy, like mm-hmm. uh, bits of broken nails, glass metal, etc. And then you'll have some sort of personal effect from whoever is being protected, in most cases, usually the urine of the person who's making the witch bottle. Um, But in some cases, they will use the urine of a target and include other items in the witch bottle. In that case, you can use it as a curse by burying it on their property. Right. So. So, pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, can be scary. can also be incredibly rewarding and incredibly powerful mm-hmm. as a protective um, measure. Right. Against harmful witchcraft. So, how far back does this go? I mean, they've discovered one dated to the 1500s? Yes. Um, most of them, that seems to be about the earliest date is the uh, 1500s there. Um, there are... Uh, indications that ancient Greeks and Romans might have used similar items, but the witch bottle, as we think of it today, probably only dates back to this. Um, they have been known also as Bellarmines, um, which is a name they got when they were named after a cardinal Bellarmine, uh, who was famous for persecuting Protestants in, I believe, England, uh, was where he was from. Sometimes these are also known as Bartman bottles. Um, there was a Bellarmine discovered in the hearth of an old cottage in Felmersham, Bedfordshire, uh, in the UK, in late 2001, which, after being x-rayed, was found to contain hair, pins, and uh, urine. So it's all the typical ingredients that you might find in a... Uh, right, so there's definitely a, a precedence for these... Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're working with them today, which yes. I always think is powerful. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there is a 17th century witch bottle, which was found um, in Greenwich. This one is interesting to me, um, partially because it was buried upside down, mm-hmm. which is a little bit different different than um, I normally think of a witch bottle. However, this particular witch bottle is slightly different than other witch bottles. Because it contained not just uh, pins and urine and personal effects for protection, uh, it also contained uh, a pair of leather hearts, which were pinned together. And I believe the fingernail clippings of the intended target and, uh, oh, what was it? It was something else that was was mildly interesting, somewhat freaky. Oh, brimstone. Right. Yeah, it contained brimstone uh, and possible navel fluff, the article says. Ugh, which... I don't know how you even get that. People sleep, sleep very deeply after a long day plowing the fields, apparently. <laughs> um, in that case, I would say that bottle probably is not used outright for protection. 
Yeah, that's pretty obviously a curse to me. Yeah, it's a, well, it's either a hex or a really intensive love spell, sort of a, that too. a love me or die kind right. of thing, uh, as it would be in hoodoo. Yeah. Um, uh, there also is a precedent in precedence in America, which is why it's on New World Witch Tree, um, or these witch bottles. Uh, there was an excavation in Essington, Pennsylvania, where this sort of a bottle was found, um, and in that bottle they had six pins. Uh, held in place by a wooden stopper and a little bottle buried, buried uh, in a small hole a cottage. Uh, and, then, and this one also contained a bird bone, which I find kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. I wonder what that was for. Not sure. I know bird bones are brittle and, you know, when broken would be fairly sharp, so it might just be a sharp object. Maybe. But to me, it seems like there must be some other significance, too. Yeah, I, I would think so, too. But yeah, so they certainly have a broad precedence. Mm-hmm. These types of uh, witch bottles where you have the container with the pins and the, the hair or the urine seem to be more European in origin. Yes. Uh, there are other examples of similar things in other cultures. For example, I know in African diasporic traditions, they have uh, what's called a bottle tree mm-hmm. uh, where they take bottles and uh, put them onto the trimmed branches of a tree and it's sort sort of hard to visualize this, but uh, not don't picture them as hanging from these tree branches. Picture these little stubby tree branches poking out, and the necks of the bottles being crammed down over the uh, the stubs of the branches. Right. And those were supposed to trap evil spirits and keep them away from you. Yeah. So it's almost like a, a dream catcher. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously not a dream. <laughs> yeah. Sort of a, a bigger version of the same thing, and yeah. um, apparently those are still sold as folk art and. America. Cool. And they're very decorative, and, and, you know, you can find them at any of your local country craft fairs, probably. So, when when people did those, was it the whole community would put on a separate bottle? I didn't or? see. The article I, I, I looked at didn't have a lot of information about how how many people would be involved. My, my guess is that in order to get enough material, you probably would have had to have multiple participants. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk more about like the the modern witch bottles. What's going on today with bottles? Well, today you've got a couple of different types of bottles. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, there is a blue cobalt bottle, mm-hmm. which is left in windowsills. I know that has some uh, small attraction for you. Yeah, and it's interesting because I started doing that, I guess about a year ago. I um, started collecting colored glass to put in my windowsill. I, don't know, I just thought it was pretty, and my grandmother always did it. And um, I didn't realize until we started researching this episode that that had a magical purpose. And, you know, it's to to catch spirits and to protect your home. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I just think it's really neat, especially because, like I said, my grandmother does it. I mean, she, she has mm-hmm. uh, colored glass all over her kitchen. So, And that's interesting to me because that seems to be sort of the best of both worlds when it comes to witch bottles because it's just a single bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's left in a, a certain place in the home, which uh, a lot of witch bottles are buried on the home premises. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's being used to catch that evil spirit sort of left out like a, like the bottle tree. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting, sort of a crossing of traditions there. Yeah. I wonder if this is a, good, a recent thing, how recent this is, I guess, is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. If it's, it's, it's something that, while it seems to have older precedents, it seems to have really kind of come into its own in the 1700s, 1800s. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, a lot of sources seem to indicate that it died off in the 19th century, early 20th century, but it's come back with a vengeance. Yeah. It's, uh, it's incredibly popular. Um, I know lots of witches who make their witch bottles to protect their homes, which is kind of funny because a lot of people who had witch bottles back in the day... We're making them to protect themselves, which is... <laughs> which is funny. There's that magic against magic again. <laughs> I know. It's all, all mixed together in one big happy pot. So, okay, let's talk about hoodoo bottle spells. Okay. And, and we have actually done some of these mm-hmm. separately and together. So, let's start with a honey jar. Mm-hmm. Well, me. You, you've done this. What is well, a honey jar? Well, first you start out with a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. And you write out... Um, your petition or maybe some names, just something to symbolize what you need. And um, and then you write, I guess, your spell, like a, a single phrase or maybe one word around that and one continuous 
like without your pen, you shouldn't leave the paper. Mm-hmm. And sort of a circle shape around. Yes, around, around the names the that names. are indicated. Right, and um, then you add. Well, you take your candle, dress the candle. Mm-hmm. With a specific type of oil, depending on what the spell is for. Mm-hmm. What did we use? Do you remember? It's kind of success, wasn't it? I think it was kind of success because we were trying to sweeten somebody up for a for a job. Mm-hmm. And we rolled it in herbs. Mm-hmm. We had three? Probably three. I mean, that would make sense in hoodoo. You'd mm-hmm. probably use an odd number. I'm fairly sure cinnamon would have been in there. Yeah, I think Possibly we gravel some. root because of the success mm-hmm. aspects. Um, and then probably some sort of a, a sweetening herb or a commanding herb, like a licorice. Yeah. It, I mean, it was something like that. It yeah. doesn't have to be exact. But um, So anyway, you... you then you roll the candle in those herbs and have it collect onto the candle. And um, you fold up the, your piece of paper with your petition on it, and then you put it in the jar, and then you pour honey over it. And, you know, the honey is, well, it's sweet, and it's sticky. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's <clears throat> sort of sweetening up the person you're trying to exactly you know, influence, I guess. Exactly. Or, and hopefully the stickiness will sort of... Trap them into your will. <laughs> right. And then what, what would you do with the candle? Where's where's that burned? Do you remember? Yes. So you put the candle in the jar, and you light it, and it burns down, and it's so amazingly cool. I remember being fascinated with this. It burns down, and it forms a seal over the top of the honey mm-hmm. from the way it, it burns. And I guess the wax floats over the, the honey kind of... Mm-hmm. It's crazy how it works, but... Anyway, so yeah, it forms a seal once it burns out, and you know, so we put the lid on it and buried it, and left it to do its job. Yes, and now that kind of a honey jar um, is one version of the hoodoo version. There's another version which I think is is really fun Mm -hmm. in hoodoo, where you don't um, seal it. You don't seal it with a candle Uh because you use the lid. You burn the candle on the lid, and you let. You know, you can burn the candle down as many times as you want to and keep the job working for uh-huh. as long as you want to and you leave it you know, on your altar or in a space where you can get to it. The cool thing about that is you use one honey jar for any name that you want. So, like, you know, if, you, if you've got one person already in that jar for sweetening and you need to sweeten somebody else, you put it in the same jar. Oh. You just keep putting names in the jar and you can have a jar that's literally, like, crammed full of little pieces of paper um, with people's names on them. Oh. In the honey, and and there's one thing I, I I'm not sure the way I've always done a honey jar, and I don't know if this is how we did it with you um, when we did this particular spell. But there is uh, when you rather than putting the name in the jar and then pouring the honey over it, you actually take the honey and pour it in the jar and push the name paper That's right. into it. We did do that, and I remember even saying, you know, really push it in there, get like get dirty. Yeah, and remember, because it gets on your hands, yeah. and then you have to... Yeah, and then you, you have to lick it off. Because you need to taste the sweetness that you're getting off of this person. Right. Very visceral. Mm-hmm. Very visceral stuff. But make sure the herbs are off your hands first. Yes. Because that can be very dangerous. <laughs> yes, and this is clearly before you have burned the candle full of the herbs into the honey. Right, so be careful. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so that's what you do with that. Yep. Yeah, so, okay, then let's talk about the converse of that. Talk about vinegar jars. Ah, uh, the vinegar jar. Yes. What do you think that would do to somebody? Sour them up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put them in a pickle. Put them in a nice little pickle. Vinegar jars um, usually involve just a simple type of vinegar. It can be a white vinegar. Um, a lot of people like to use cider vinegars because yeah. it's very easy to, to do that. You can also get natural cider vinegars a little more easily. Um, and what you do with that is very much the same. You're going to take the name paper of the person, you're going to put it into the jar, and you're going to have them have a pretty sour life uh, until they, they do what you want. Then you can take their name out of the jar. Gotcha. So um, is, is it is it similar, kin to a hex? Yes. Until like, a, a requirement is fulfilled? Yes. I mean, it, it certainly is. It's, it's more of a curse than it is anything else. Okay. Um, you can do souring jars where you sour people towards each other by oh. um, writing their names crossways on the same piece of paper. I think I remember doing something like that. I don't think we did, I don't think we did a souring jar like that. We made a sweetening jar like that. Okay. Just, you can do a similar thing. Um, you don't have to burn a candle on the souring jar. You certainly can. Mm-hmm. Um, but like to use souring jars, and 
uh, is to add other ingredients like uh, red pepper flakes, which it makes it both uh, sour and hot for whoever's in there, so that they experience sort of a maximum level of discomfort until right. until. Do you have to do the same thing as the honey jar where you push it down with your fingers? Um, no, I don't. I, I didn't. I don't. I say no. I don't do it that way. Okay. Um, I'm sure there are root workers who do. Okay. Um, but you're not necessarily trying to taste the sourness of their life. You're just trying to sour them up. Now, one thing that you do do that's different than a honey jar is uh, every time you pass by that jar, if you leave it in a place where you can get to it pretty regularly, mm -hmm. every time you pass by, you pick up the jar and shake it. Okay. Because it stirs up trouble for them. Right. And that's pretty re um, prevalent in hoodoo jar spells anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, there's another one called a... A shaken bottle spell, am I, is that yes. right? Yes, I mean, it's basically the same thing. Right. Um, and you can do it for any kind of influence that you want. Oftentimes, these are for negative influences. Though. Right. Okay, well, that's, that's our hoodoo. And, you know, we'll have uh, some show notes where you, we can, um, you know, we'll list some links where you can find mm -hmm. out more about this. Yes, Catherine Ironwood on her website has a good rundown of a lot yeah. of things. She, she also mentions Latin American trusks. Mm-hmm. Which are um, we're not going to get into them a lot here. Uh, they're very similar, though, to this. Only uh, one of the things I really like about them is that you sort of set up a little scene inside the bottle, uh, so that all of your little ingredients are, are set up to sort of make this ideal setting, and then you cap it off and sort of like you seal that um, that power for that desire into the bottle. It almost looks like a diorama. Yeah, it is. It's just that's just it. It's it's, it's it's basically kind of what it is. It's a diorama of whatever it wish you want fulfilled. That's pretty neat. It's really cool. It's a, it's a cool little thing. But we'll put a link to that on the show notes yeah. so everyone can see it. Okay, so, you know, we've discussed the hoodoo ones. Let's talk about the European style, which is what we have done. Yes, and this is what we'll be talking about mostly in this show. Mm -hmm. um, the European style is uh, any more people use glass most of the time, some people still use ceramic uh, stoneware as well. I don't know a lot of people who use um, stoneware with faces carved into it, which is uh, what a lot of the older ones had. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have like a, an ugly, ugly face uh -huh. because they're trying to scare off evil. Right. Um, people don't do that so much. Anymore. I think now it's mainly glass. Yeah, glass is the is the most popular. Yeah. Um, you still want to fill it with uh, something sharp and pointy. Yeah, well, let's talk about what we did, and sure. maybe like the, some variants that you could do on that. Yeah, absolutely. So the ones we, the one we did when we first kind of started working together, we wanted to do something cool and witchy that we'd never done before. So we made a witch ball for each of our houses, and plus we had just bought houses pretty much within like a month of each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we started with a nail pointing up. Yes. And. Um, and to, to be fair, that I think was more of a personal preference. It doesn't have to be that way because these things are going to shift and settle over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we um, added jagged gravel mm -hmm. around that so it it kind of held the, the nail in place, point up. And then I think we added broken glass after that mm -hmm. a little bit. Broken glass or maybe like little bits of broken like plates or pottery or something like that. Mm -hmm. But whatever it was, it was things. Yeah. That's what you really want. That's what you really want to have, you know, dealing with any problems that come your way. You want jagged, pointy things. <laughs> and then I remembered um, one other thing we did. We did a penny after that we, that we pressed. Oh, yes. Because we did sand mm -hmm. over the gravel. Mm -hmm. And then a penny. Well, the sand was to for the, the spirits to count. Yes, the spirits has to have to be able to count whatever's in the jar. Right. And um, I think the penny sort of... Yeah, so we use the penny from our birth year to signify us. Yes, yes. That's what um, So that's what that was. That was a sort of our, uh, our signifier. And I know I spit into my bottle. I don't know if you spit into yours. I don't remember. But yeah, so you would want to do something something for personal effect. Like it could be hair. You may have done hair. You may have done, may have done hair. hair. Yeah. In yours. Um, and so you want something. But when you're doing it, it's important to note that what you're trying to do is you're trying to use dead material from your body. Hence, urine, hair, saliva, uh, fingernails would work okay, too. Mm -hmm. um, because you want something that is not what's what would be called a living material. It's not still uh, highly activated and connected to you like blood and, and uh, sexual fluids are. Right. You want any spirit that gets in there 
um, to if if they manage to get to your your personal effects that are in there, you don't want something that's going to be still linked to you to get be to be dragged around that bottle and shredding you up. Right, because you, all all the pointy things are for shredding the the bad energy, the spirit, the negative spirits. You mm-hmm. know, um, pretty much into. Netherines. <laughs> yes. So they won't come into your house. Yes. The, the whole idea behind it is that they, they sense your presence. Mm-hmm. And because you've magically charged this thing with little bits of you, they're going to be drawn to it. But the problem is that they're drawn to this dead material that's left over of you, trapped among all these jagged bits and pieces and all these things they have to count. You're making it really difficult for them to come get you. Right. And so after that... um we poured wax over it from a candle. And mm-hmm. so we sealed the, the bottle and then we kind of carved um, a protective sigil into it with mm-hmm. a needle. Yes. Um, and, and that sort of sets the seal, traps whatever it is, can't get back out. Right. And then we buried it near our front doors. Mm-hmm. And that was that. Yes. And now when you're doing a witch body, you don't ever want to tell anybody exactly where you buried it unless you really, really, really trust that person. Right. Because... The other part of it is, if they ever dug it up, they would have they would have one not only some personal effects of yours, mm-hmm. um, which is not usually a good thing, right? You don't want them to. Have, I mean, even though these things are are detached from you in a way, they could still be reactivated by a knowing a knowing root worker mm-hmm. and linked back to you and cause some ha- havoc for you. But not only do they have that, but they also have as many pissed off spirits as, as might still be stuck in that bottle <laughs> that, that really have a vendetta against you now. Mm-hmm. So you uh, you definitely don't want to let people know where this is. Um, should you need to get rid of it for any reason? Like um, maybe you're moving? Yes, if you're moving. Uh, I've heard that you can pour salt water on the spot. I don't know if that's a great idea um, because you leave a nice big dead patch in your lawn. <laughs> I've heard that you can do that to neutralize the witch bottle. Uh, additionally, you could dig it up and throw it into a moving body of water. Mm-hmm. This thing is either a tidal shift near an ocean or a river. It's always mm-hmm. really good. So that's how you that's how you get rid of uh, your witch bottle when you're done with it. Right. All right. So what else we got to say on witch bottles? Hmm. Well, so how was the experience of, of doing a European style witch bottle? Did you do you feel it's effective? I love it. It's it, it's one of those it's one of those things that I always think. You know, if nothing else, if I've done nothing else to protect my home, I've got that. And I do, I, I renew my, my protective stuff at least once a year. Uh, but that's sort of my all-time protection. Mm-hmm. It's, it's my backup alarm system, magically. <laughs> what about you? Yeah. I, I I like knowing that I have it there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that I've mentioned probably several times now, but I really like that aspect of having a connection to the past. So, Yeah, it's neat because it's something that's been done for a couple hundred years. Interestingly enough, about as long as America's been a country. Right. So, uh, you know, while, while it has older precedents even than that, in the form that we know it now, right? basically it dates to New World. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what we're doing is what they did, and mm-hmm. I always like that aspect in a spell. Yeah, and it's very simple folk magic, mm-hmm. very easy to do. You don't have to overcomplicate this. You know, we put a lot of stuff into ours. In reality, you can get a jar, you can get a baby food jar, a uh, couple of nails or some broken glass, and, you know, some spit, some urine, some hair, or something like that. Yeah. Seal that up and bury it, and you basically got a witch. Right, and there's no... And also, there's kind of nothing ceremonial about it. Mm-mm. Like you know, you can just sit down and make one, and you don't you don't have to chant anything over it. You don't have to cast a circle to work in. You know, you just mm-hmm. you just do it. Nope, very straightforward folk magic. Yeah, I really it, like that. It fits in that uh, magic versus magic vein that happened so often in the colonial times. Mm-hmm. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, with the honey jars, did you have any? Uh, what was your end result with the honey jar? Well, it didn't work. Okay. But. Uh, well, I should say, I didn't get the job. Right. But, you know, that's okay. They, they were um, inundated with replies mm-hmm. and actions. And uh, they're very gracious in how they let everyone down. So, you know, they were very sweet about it, which... That's always nice. <laughs> and you still, you still are in connection with them, I believe. Yes. As well, so. And it... Um, and, you know, if nothing else, it was a good experience to have. Now I know how to do one. Mm-hmm. And... Um, 
you know, like like you said, we didn't have any personal effects of theirs, so maybe that would have helped. Mm-hmm. And now I know how to do it yeah. for someone more, you know, that I know that I really know. Right. If you're doing something so specific, like such a such a spell of a honey jar, as opposed to the ones where you're just trying to generally sweeten them up with the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the more the more personal stuff you can get, the better. Right. So yeah, I'm really glad I know how to do one now. Yeah. So. You think you're going to do another one anytime soon? You got anybody you need to sweeten up? Hmm. Maybe. We'll see. Hmm. Be a good experiment. Mm, I, I sense a project. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. Um, my experience with the uh, with the jars, I've, I've always had really good experiences with the honey jars. Um, yeah, I know you, had, you did something for your, your boss, didn't you? Yes, I have done... Should I? <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> I seriously <laughs> doubt you know. this. No. <laughs> I seriously doubt my boss is listening to this. Um, I've done honey jars for um, several several people in places of employment. Uh, and those have always been really effective. Um, not not so much as they would, you know, like I would, I didn't ever do them to get a job, but I did them to improve your working environment. Right. To make it a lot less, uh, a lot less likely that I would get fired, which is, you know, I still got the job. So pretty happy with that. Right. What about vinegar jars? How would they work for you? Those not so much. Um, hmm. because I don't, I, I kind of did it half, half acidly. Um, how so? You know, I just had the vinegar jar, and I had the name paper, and I shoved it in there, and then just kind of forgot about it. Gotcha. So, you know, and I, you know, I'd think about them every once in a while, and be like, oh, I really want their their life to be kind of miserable for a minute. I wouldn't go shake the jar. I wouldn't do anything with it mm-hmm. because I, I think there was still that little bit of moral quandary, like it really justified. It's really justified action. Right. And and while I'm not shy about hexing, uh, I also like it to be justified. Right. You have to really. Sit down and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it for a karmic balance, or is it because I'm pissed off? Exactly. And, and I don't like to do stuff just because I'm angry at somebody. Uh, I have to feel like, you know, this is serving universal justice. This is serving some greater purpose. You know, this is a bad person. This is a person who needs to, to go through some trials and be tempered by them. Mm-hmm. Um, and and in the end, it just it wasn't worth it. Uh, I did wind up later doing a... Honey spell. <laughs> Ooh, bless you. Good night. Good Sneeze for what was this? This is a month. This is a Saturday. What's it? Sneeze on a Saturday. I don't remember anymore. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, so many notes. So little time. Uh, sneeze on a Saturday. See your bow tomorrow, or a friend you seek. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I will see my bow tomorrow. I in hope the so. <laughs> And you're seeking a friend, so we're that's, good. That's right, we're good. I'm pointing at myself there, you can't see me pointing. <laughs> it's not a video podcast. Um, anyway. I have to work it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the souring jar, the souring jar I kind of gave up on, and it didn't work too. No, uh, let me put it this way. I don't know if their life got any sour, more sour. Oh. I have no idea. They might have, but. And I have no indication that it did. Okay. But then I later did a pay me spell because a lot of the reason I did this for this person is that they they have money that is mine. Oh. And should not have it. Gotcha. Uh, and so I did a pay me spell and immediately started getting checks from them. So. Really? Mm-hmm. Within a week. Wow. Got like three checks within two months. Quite, quite nice ones. Enjoyed that. Nice. We'll have to talk about that later then when we do more like, about money. Mm-hmm. And prosperity. Indeed. And making people pay you. <laughs> pay you with the O. Oh. Thank you to Kat, Catherine Ironwood, by the way, for the uh, fantastic pay me now incense. <laughs> That's lovely stuff. She's awesome. She is, she is pretty much the business. She's the bee's knees. In, indeed. <laughs> you know, I've often wondered, like, the business, and the bee's knees, bee's knees, hmm. is it related? I don't know. I think the bees knees came first. But the word business surely is older than that. Right, but people didn't say she's the business. Mm, no. <laughs> Etymology <laughs> and witchcraft. Are they related? You decide. <laughs> so, anyhow. All right, so that's it for Witch Bobbles for today. We hope that this has been informative and interesting to you. If you have any 
comments or if you've heard of other types of bottle spells in different traditions, then please let us know. I'd be very interested to hear about that. And yeah, yeah. and uh, we hope that you're kind of into this whole uh, special feature. Uh, episode. These features are not going to be regular. They're not part of a regular lineup uh, for our show. We're still going to keep to the two episodes per month format and these are just going to be periodic little uh, tidbits that show up. Yeah, and uh, they're going to be very practical Mm -hmm. and with usually, you know, just one main subject. Yes. Yeah, and we'll give you a little bit of history, a little bit of lore regarding them, uh, and then we'll get into the specifics of different ways to do uh, whatever the topic is and our personal experiences with that topic. Right. So, yeah, we so, really hope you'll enjoy them. Yeah. We've got... Uh, yeah, we have um, a few of them lined up. We're going to talk about witch ladders. And uh, working against the evil eye. Poppets. Uh, and uh, something that is near and dear to me, spiritual cleansing or limpias. So, got a lot of that stuff hopefully will be coming up over the next few months. Yeah. So... I think that'll be fun. Me too. Hopefully you do too. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Be well. New World Witchery is produced using GarageBand on Mac. The song you're listening to is Grifos Muertos by Jeffrey Luck Lucas from his album What We Whisper and can be found on magnitude.com. Thanks for listening.